Thank you, Pulse Band. Appreciate that. Well, welcome to Pulse Worship. Good evening, Cathedral of Hope. All right. Well, I know we're here to worship this evening, um, and we're going to get straight into that. So let's just bow and welcome God into this place and to center ourselves. Join me in prayer. Holy One, we thank you for bringing us all here tonight. Just ask that you uh, would be blessed by our worship, that you would inhabit our praises and help us to learn all that you would have us to learn tonight in the message, in the singing, and in the communion. We ask you to bless this time together this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So for those who decided to come to church tonight and put the debate on record, <laughs> we've got a new song for y'all. This is just a fun song. It's talking about us waking up to the promises of God. Why don't you rise if you're able and have a little bit of fun with us tonight. Break of day, in hope we rise. We speak your name. We lift our eyes, tune our hearts into your feet. Where we walk, there you will be. With fire in our eyes, our lives alight. Your love untamed is blazing out. The streets will go forever bright. Your glory is breaking through the night. You will never fade away. Your love is here to stay by my side in my life. Shining through me every day. You will never fade away. Your love is here to stay by my side in my life. Shining through me every day. Come on, say you wake. Wake within me, wake within me. You're in my heart forever. You wake within me, wake within me. You're in my heart forever. Can anybody testify of that tonight? Fire in our eyes, our lives are light. Your love untamed is blazing out. The streets will glow forever bright. Your glory is breaking through the night. You will never fade away. Your love is here to stay by my side in my life. Shining through me every day. You will never fade away. Your love is here to stay by my side in my life. Shining through me every day. Somebody lift up a shout of praise. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Somebody lift up a real shout of praise. You wake within me, wake within me. You're in my heart forever. You wake within me, wake within me. You're in my heart
Tonight we are focusing on a spiritual detox, letting go of those things that no longer serve us, letting go of those things that keep us from getting to that next place that you've destined us to be. And we start off by saying that we won't go back to those toxic things that try to pull us in. We claim that we truly have been changed, not by some guilt or some guilt-driven motive, but we have been changed by the love that we have found in you. We have been changed by the love that we have found in this place and through your people, your authentic people who bring us out of the margins and into the fold so that we can continue to be what you have called us to be. Sing this together. I've been changed. He Been changed. I've been changed in the presence of the Lord. Free, free, free delivered. fear tonight somebody say my past I don't live there no more
We refuse, we refuse to go back. Yes, we look back because it's a part of our story. We can look back and we can see those things that made us who we are today, but we refuse to go and be entangled by those same things that once held us before. God, and we re reclaim these words tonight because I think a lot of times because of our past, we don't like to use the word sin. We don't like to talk about being bound in a negative way by things because it seems too much like the condemnation message that we grew up with. But I challenge you to reclaim that and to reform it for yourself because there are things that we attach ourselves to. There's religious doctrines that we attach ourselves to that keep us up at night, that don't allow us to get sleep, that don't allow us to truly accept ourselves. So we let that go. When we say, all my sin forgiven, I'm sorry, but I still believe in sin. Sin isn't just about a bunch of things listed in the Bible that we're not supposed to do, but it's us actually doing the things that tear our own selves down. It's doing those things that hurt us. The Bible says, he that doeth to do good, her that doeth to do good and doeth it not to that person, it is sin. And so we reclaim that word and we say, God, if there's something in my life, I let it go. And I won't go back to those things any longer. I surrender all to you, everything I give, withholding nothing.
So friends, we've just sung about not being able to go back. I want to tell you what on earth is there to go back to? Once you've known the love of God, there is nothing that uh, will surpass, nothing that will change, nothing that will substitute for that true essence of the love that God puts into our hearts. And so when we sing, I can't go back, the truth is we can't go back because love has already shown us the way out, the way forward. And I love what Chris said, you know, we can sometimes look back and see where we've been, but we can't ever go back to that place. So often those places have not been good places for us. So let us invoke that spirit, that place of holiness within ourselves as we come and as we ask God to bless this word. Would you pray with me? Loving and holy one, thank you that you have brought us from a place to this place. And it is in this place, O oh God, that we find sanctuary, we find your grace, we find your love, we find your presence this night. So help us to come now into this holy place within each and every one of us and in this place that we call church. Anoint us and bless us with that grace of abundance that reminds us always of your faithfulness and the grace that you have provided for each and every one of us. And now, God, as we open our hearts and our minds to hear your word, to receive it afresh and anew, open us to the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, a God that is still speaking and still living through each and every one of us. And it is in that that we get to hear your word in truth this night. And now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this night. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the Christ in whom we pray, alleluia and amen. Well, I certainly hope that what happens on this platform this evening is better than what's happening in just a few moments on a platform somewhere else. I certainly hope that what we receive here this night is good news, good news for each and every one of us, good news that will touch our hearts, and not because I speak it, because we believe that the Holy Spirit will speak through us and will interpret whatever comes from my mouth to touch our hearts this night. I want to read to you from Scripture. It's from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 10, and I begin at verse 9 through 16, and I do have to put my glasses back on. I am getting old. Here we go. The New International Version says this. About noon the following day, as they were on a journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back up to heaven. And you might wonder, what on earth is this Scripture really all about? What on earth is God trying to tell us as followers of Jesus today? What, what does it mean? What did it mean for Peter all of those years ago? And what does it mean for us, especially those of us who are in the business of reclaiming Christianity? What does it mean for us as progressive Christians, as people who are willing to fall back in love with Jesus? What does it mean for us as progressive people of faith that this story written all of these centuries ago, what does that have meaning for us? And especially in the meaning of the habits of happiness and the detox that we're being invited to this night. Well, I think it has a lot to do with us, and I'll try to unpack this scripture for us a little bit in order that we might see some of the truth that comes from the meaning of what was happening for Peter in this scene all those years ago. Now, in order, of course, for us to understand the scripture, we need to know who Peter is. Now, Peter is a good Jew. Peter is someone who has uh, been brought up uh, in the synagogue. He's someone who knew Torah, who knew the Jewish law. Um, he's someone who was a, 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 a convert in some ways to Christianity, but he still had with him the baggage of his past. How many of us can relate to Peter this evening? That we have so much of the baggage of our past that sometimes has to be confronted by the Word of God. Now, some of that baggage might not be from our scriptures. Some of that baggage might be from some previous church experience. It might be from some previous uh, teaching that we've heard. It, it might be some fable or some tale that we've been told is in the Bible, but none of us have really taken the time to go back and actually find out if it is in the Bible at all. So much of what Peter experienced was tradition. It was so much of what he knew in his own culture was some of the traditions of the rabbis that had been passed on from generation to generation. Peter lived in a time where there was the temple in Jerusalem. And at certain parts of the year, they would go to the temple of Jerusalem and they would sacrifice animals for the impureness that lived in their lives and in their hearts. And there would be uh, extreme calculations of what you needed to sacrifice in order to be made clean. And you would go to the temple, and in the temple there would be these, these cellars of, of doves and, and animals and reptiles and all sorts of different things that were given some economy in which they were then sacrificed, and the blood would be taken into the temple and burnt as a sacrifice to our God. Uh, a burnt offering that would release people from their sins. And in their system, that's how this worked. And there were certain things that were unclean. There were certain animals that were unclean. You might have heard perhaps that uh, Jews aren't allowed to eat shellfish, for instance, uh, because it's considered unclean. Or, or, or some other animal that is unclean and not allowed to be touched. So, so Peter grew up in this whole system of sacrifice and this whole notion that there were some things that were pure, some things that were not pure, some things that by ritualistic regulation should not be touched. And that's where we meet Peter. Imagine what it might be for like some of us who have been told that there are certain things you can't do in order to call yourself a follower of Jesus. Or, or there are certain rituals that you're not allowed to be involved in. I know that there are people constantly who come to me and say, can I still be a Christian and, and you put in, you fill in the dot. Perhaps you've been those people before. Perhaps I'm still one of those people. I don't know. There are still certain things that, that are taboo in my own life that they really don't have anything to do with Scripture necessarily, but they have to do with my culture or my background or my biblical understanding of a particular period in my life that still every now and again pop up and I have to sit there and say, now where did that come from? Have you, any of you ever had that experience in your own life? You suddenly think and you think, now where did that come from? What, what, did, what happened to me at a period in my life or, or some theological understanding or some baggage that still exists? It's like those old tapes that run through your head. I know that many of us have those old tapes that run in our heads uh, that tell us all sorts of things. Um, and perhaps, perhaps Jesus called them demons, I don't know. But there were certain things that happened in our head or play around in our head. Um, I always like to think that there are two, two little things, uh, two little persons on my shoulder. Uh, there's the good angel and the bad angel. And the good angel is always telling me what I can do and the bad angel is always telling me what I can't do. But the bad angel is always tempting me to do the things that I shouldn't do. Amen? Oh, good. I'm glad you're still there. 
You know, you can shout back at me if you want to. I'm really a bit like Andre on a Wednesday night. You really can shout back. Um, you can shout out hallelujah. You can do all sorts of things. You can run a lap if you want to this evening if you feel that the, the Holy Spirit is blessing you. Um, you know, because nothing is impossible for the God that we believe. You know, so, so here we have Peter stepping into this moment. And it says that he's now uh, been on a mission and he's been on a journey and he's hungry. And he's in what we would consider at that period of time Gentile territory. Um, he's in a place that is not Jewish, not kosher. He's in a place uh, with the Gentiles. The Acts of the Apostles is really about the stories of converted the Acts of the Apostles, those early apostles as they went about the ministry of Jesus. And so Peter's in a, a foreign place. And it says that Peter suddenly fell into a trance. Now, perhaps he just fainted with hunger. I don't know what happened for Peter that day, uh, but he fell into a trance. And it says that in that trance, in that dream state, there was this, it seemed like a sheet that descended from heaven. And on that sheet was everything that he was not allowed to touch. Everything that he was not allowed, he'd been told by his rituals, by his culture, by his theology, by, by the traditions from the rabbis all the way passed down. All these things that he was not allowed to touch because they were seen as unclean or they were seen as something that God had forbade him to eat. And it says that in this trance, now can you imagine if you've been told you're not allowed to touch something? Now if you're anything like many of us, if you've been told you're not allowed to touch something, the first thing you want to do is go and touch it, Right? Can you imagine what Peter must have been thinking now? He's famished. He's hungry. He's in this trance state, and he's got all of these things that have been laid out in front of him that he's not allowed to touch. And he's kind of thought that perhaps that, that little demon on his shoulder saying, oh, go on, Peter, you can do it. Go on, Peter, you can touch it. And in, his, in the other side, there's all of this, this stuff in his heritage that says, no, no, you mustn't, you mustn't. It's unclean, it's unclean. And it says that the voice of God says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Oh my God. I mean, I don't like the kill piece, but, but the eat piece I can just about cope with. Get up and eat. Get up and touch. Get up and fat, ra ravish your, yourself on all of this bounty that God has placed before you. And it says that Peter, in his, in, his, in his theological stand, in this place where he's got all of this baggage that's suddenly right out in front of him, it says that he mustn't, he mustn't, he mustn't. And it says that, that the second voice came and he said, How? Get up and eat. Do not call anything that God has called clean, unclean. No, go the other way around. Don't, touch, don't say anything that you've been told is unclean. Get up and eat. And Peter's still wrestling with all of this stuff that's going on in his life. And it says that just at that moment, this sheet disappears and goes up into heaven. Peter was faced with a spiritual detox right at that very moment. Peter was confronted with all of the baggage of his past, all the baggage of his theology, all of the, the teachings that had told him that, that certain things were clean and certain things were unclean. And here is God saying, you cannot call anything unclean that I have made pure. Friends, it is time for us to have a spiritual detox in our own lives. Because there are many of us who are sitting in this room this evening who have been told all sorts of things are that clean and unclean. There are so many of us in this room this evening who have been told that there are only certain things or certain people or certain lifestyles or certain theologies that are acceptable to God. There are many of us who have been told that there's only one way to God. We have been many of us who have been told that there's only one way in which you get into heaven. There's so many of us who have been told so much that the Bible does not necessarily say. And we are sitting here this evening with a blanket right in front of us and looking around at the lives around us and in all of our diversity. And we might question whether someone can be a Christian or whether they cannot be a Christian. And God is saying to us tonight, don't tell me what is clean and what is unclean. Don't tell me who is acceptable to God and who is not acceptable to God. Don't tell me what theology is truth and what theology is untruth. God has put a blanket right out in front of us and is confronting us in our own theology and confronting us this evening by the reality of the lives that sit around us that we might not think are acceptable to God, but God says, you don't have that right to say yes or no. It is time for us to have a spiritual detox. 
A spiritual detox from the the baggage of the theology that still continues to tell us today that some people are welcome and some people are not. And we, you and I, here this evening, we have an opportunity to make that spiritual detox real for ourselves and begin to believe in the exhaustible, unexplainable, ravishing, gracious love of God that is acceptable to each and every one of us just where we are this night. I'm sure that there are people in this room tonight who've been told that you cannot be a gay man or a lesbian and a Christian or transgender or bisexual or asexual. Uh, There are people in this room this night who have been told that the Bible condemns homosexuality and it's time for us to have a spiritual detox and to debunk those scriptures that condemn homosexuality because there is no scripture that condemns homosexuality. Now listen to me. There are many of us who are sitting in this room who have come from conservative backgrounds. And we have wrestled with those six clobber passages. I I always tell people um, that there may be or may not be six passages that regulate homosexual lifestyle. But you know that there are 366 scriptures that regulate heterosexual lifestyle. So God was obviously more concerned about heterosexuals than about homosexuals. (laughs) And I I don't say that, I say that glibly, I know that, but you know, when people start doing the Bible at dawn thing, you know, and I've had people who have said to me, you know, let's let's bring our Bibles to the coffee table, and they want the Bible at dawn, they want to hit me with their Bible, and they expect me to hit them back with this other Bible, and I say, that's not what the Word of God is for, the Word of God is not a weapon, the Word of God is a, a truth of love and grace that is available to us all. That's really the truth. But quite honestly, many of us who come from conservative backgrounds and who are LGBT or, 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 or an ally, we, we have wrestled with these club passages and we've come to an understanding that the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. But the reality is that we still then take literally all the rest of the Bible. <laughs> you went quiet for a moment. We still take literally everything else that's contained in the Bible because we just look in this this little tiny piece of Scripture, this little tiny piece of the Word, six passages from the Old and New Testament, and we've reconciled ourselves to those, but we also need to reconcile ourselves to all the rest of the Bible as well. We need to reconcile ourselves to this progressive gospel of Jesus that is not about condemning, is not about rules and regulations, is not about dogma, but is about the values of the Jesus that we live. And Jesus sets that blanket down in front of us tonight and says, get up and eat it. Get up and enjoy it. Get up and live life to the absolute fullest and allow the Holy Spirit to tell you what's clean and what's not unclean. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach us this night so that we can have that spiritual detox and and get rid of this baggage, that root to happen, that habits of happiness is by having a spiritual detox on a regular basis, not just on a Wednesday night, but having that spiritual detox in our lives so that we can really do the hard work of looking into the Word of God. Progressive Christianity is not about throwing the Bible out. The, The progressive Christianity is about falling in love with our Bible all over again. It's about really knowing the Word of God, really knowing what is in our Bible and not just leaving it on the shelf with all that dust gathering week in and week out, but getting it out and studying it and knowing it and not just looking at the words that are on the page, but knowing the social locations of the people that we speak of, knowing their lives, knowing their stories, knowing where they've come from, knowing the baggage that they brought with them. You know, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament brought a lot of baggage with him to the table and the writings of the Scriptures. And we need to know what those things are in order that we might truly understand the liberating Word of God. We need to truly know our Bible as our friend and to know it inside and out, not so that we can hit other people on the head with it, but so that we can liberate people from the baggage and from the chains and from the places that many of us have come from, and quite honestly, many of us are still journeying to become. The truth is, God wants to give us happiness in our lives, 
And we can't have happiness in our lives if we're bogged down by the damage of the church, if we're bogged down with the damage of the way people have interpreted Scripture, or the, the way that people have used Scripture condemn us, or the way that people have used the Bible to, to tell us that we're going to hell in a handbasket. We can't have happiness in our lives if we don't know Jesus personally as our friend and our lover and our carer and our redeemer and our savior and all of the things that Jesus promises to be for us. We, we can't be happy if we're bogged down in somebody else's theology. We have to be bogged down in our own theology that is a theology of liberation and truth and hope for the rest of the world. There are too many people who are using the Bible, even tonight, using the Bible to divide communities and to divide peoples. That Bible was used for Peter. It wasn't the Bible as we know it today, but there was still a Bible that was in place that was used against Peter. And God said to him in a trance, look, I'm placing it all out here. All the things that you've been told were, were not good. All the things that you were told that people couldn't be and be a Christian. And I'm telling you this evening, get up and eat. Get up and enjoy. Get up and see. Get up and taste that God is good. All the time, God is good. And will liberate us from these systems of oppression that often we just lay on our shoulders this night. Spiritual detox. Getting rid of some of the stuff that no longer serves us. Get, getting rid of the stuff that of, often we use as a crutch. Instead of getting rid of the crutch and getting up and walk, wasn't Jesus in the healing business? Wasn't Jesus about getting rid of those crutches that have, have propped us up and telling us to run down the aisle and to run into life and to run into the joy of what it is to be a follower of Jesus? I can't go back, we said. I give it all to you, I said. Well, if that's the real truth, if that's really what our intent is this evening, then we better get into rehab pretty quickly and get rid of some of this, this baggage that continues to haunt us and continues to tell us that we're less than rather than everything that we have given to our God. Traditions, theological baggage, church tradition, there's a story of a family who at Thanksgiving would gather together every single year and every single year they would get their turkey and they would cut the legs off and they would cut the head off and they would cut the, the, the turkey into pieces and they would put it into a pan and they would put it into the oven. And every year they would do this. It was a tradition that was passed down from one generation to the generation. And one day this, this family said to him, said, yeah, I've noticed every year you, 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 you get your pan and you take this turkey and instead of putting it in the oven all to one piece, you, you cut it down into little pieces. He said, I, I want to know why you do that. And the, 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 the dad said, I, I don't know. I, I saw my mom do it. And I, I saw my mom's mom do it. It's a tradition that's been passed down through our family, and, 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 and that's what we do every Thanksgiving. That's how we do our turkey dinner. And then suddenly this person gets to heaven, and in heaven they see the great-grandmothers, grandmothers, grandmothers, grandmothers who started this tradition, and they said, I want to ask you, why on earth do we do that on Thanksgiving? Why is it that we take this beautiful turkey that's just been laid out there for us and instead of just putting the whole thing in and stuffing it just like everybody else does, why do we take all the pieces off and put it in the oven like that? And she said, well, in my day, we didn't have a pan big enough to put the whole turkey in. <laughs> Many of us are living just like that. We've had traditions passed down for us and we don't understand why we even believe what we believe anymore or why we do what we do anymore. And Jesus invites us this evening, oh, look at this. We've got a lesbian over here. We've got a bisexual man over here. We've got someone in a polyamorous relationship over there. We've got a, a, a heterosexual person over here. And, 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 and look and taste and see just how good this is. This God who created all of us just as we are. And says, get up. Because it's not about what you do. It's about how you live. It's about how you live out your vocation to be a follower of Jesus. And what might be good for one and one person might be very different from another person. But it's not our, not our job to challenge it or to judge it. 
Our job is to just allow the Holy Spirit to work through the lives of individuals just like you and me and allow the Spirit to tell us what is right and what is wrong, what is good for one and what might not be good for somebody else. If there's anything about my work with people in 12-step traditions, I have learned this, that what I am able to do is a, a, a permissible for me around taking a, 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 I don't want to be a trigger tonight, so I'm not going to say, but taking a drink for myself, what might be permissible for me might not be permissible for somebody else. But that doesn't make that other person less than I am. What it means is that's just who they are as an individual and thank God for our individuality. Paul says all things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. We are taught to learn for ourselves what is permissible and what is not permissible, what is beneficial and what is not beneficial, and allow it to stand on its own feet, on its own lives, on its own merits, because the Holy Spirit makes us just as we are. God, I wish this was spoken on the stage tonight. Instead of this dividing peoples up, Reminding that we are all made in the divine image of a loving God. You ready for a spiritual detox? You know, it's hard work. It's not just something that happens. It means that we have to pour our heart and soul into knowing what we believe and why we believe what we believe. It means that we need to examine all of the, the scriptural references and all of the scriptures and to understand for ourselves the social locations. That means we might have to go to a Bible study. Oh, no. It means that we might have to sit with one another and say, hey, what do you believe about this? And, and what do you believe about this? And then allow the Spirit to connect the dots and find out in our own lives what we believe about something. And not to say then what I believe means that that is the right way, but to know that that's what I believe because that's what I believe. And then hold truth until God the Holy Spirit moves us to another place. I've discovered one thing about my life is that when I think I've got it all sewn up, God has already moved and said, okay, now come chase me again. Come and find me again. Because that is the liberating God who is always on the move, who is always speaking, who is always showing us a new thing. Behold, I make all things new. Not just for that generation, but for this generation as well. Later on this evening, we're going to invite you as you leave tonight to pick up uh, seven days of a spiritual detox. We're going to invite you over the next seven days to just take this card and do this for seven days. It's not a lot of a commitment, but it might help us in letting go of some of the stuff that many of us hold on to. On day, top, day one, we're going to invite you to have a spiritual detox on shame and regrets. Oh, we could probably last there for a year, right? <laughs> But we're just going to let you do it for one day. We're going to invite you to detox from shame and regret, some of that old baggage in our lives. On day two, we're going to ask you to let go of fear and worry. There's another year of work. <laughs> day three, a detox of bitterness and envy. Ooh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, there's another two years. Day four, the detox from habits of sin. See, we're not afraid to talk about sin, about sin here. But I want us to hear this really clear. When you start looking at this one on the detox of sin, just know that sin is missing the mark. It's not something that we hit ourselves over the, bear, over the head with. Sin is when we miss the mark of something that we have set as a standard for ourselves and we miss it. Sin is not something that we beat ourselves up over. It's sin is something that God has already given forgiveness from in order that we might get up and try again. It's that old adage, if, you don't, if at first you don't succeed, try, 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 try again. So day, day four is a detox from sin, habits of sin that might lead us to our habits of happiness. Day five is a detox of procrastination and laziness. Okay, we'll, we'll come back in 10 years on that one. Or we might never ever get to it. Day six is a detox from negativity and doubt. Ooh, I'm giving a lifetime of work here. 
And then day seven is a detox from self-centeredness. It's all about me. Of course it's all about me. All about me. So I'm going to invite you to pick up one of these cards as you leave. And just over the next seven days, starting tomorrow, let's, let's do a detox. Let's do a detox as a possible route to a habit of happiness. And then next, next Wednesday, we're going to invite you to come back. And on next Wednesday, we're going to invite you to fill out a card that says, what is it, what happened to you over these last seven days? Or perhaps what is it that you've learned from this, this exercise that you really, really do need to let go of? That that detox has led you to know you need to let go of. And then next Wednesday, we're going to do some ritual that will enable us to visualize how we can let go of it and to find a habit of happiness that perhaps for the next seven days after that, we take on an affirmation, an affirmation that reminds us that we are good and that we are holy and that we are perfect just the way we are. I want to tell us not one of us is perfect, but we become perfect as we take on the likeness of Christ in our lives. May God bless us this night. And may we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us directly because that's what the job of the Spirit is, to speak to us directly and to let go of some of the baggage that no longer serves us, but rather oppresses us. To God be the glory. Amen. God bless you. I don't know how many of you guys have had this where you had one of those days where you just thought maybe you weren't going to make it to church and then you get here and you hear a message like that. I feel like I have work to do now. Thank you for that. I brought this as a cheat sheet because I have announcements to tell you guys. Um, we do want to meet with you. If you heard something tonight that inspired you, that touched you, maybe you have questions, we have Pulse Cafe immediately after this. Um, this Sunday at 1 p.m., we have a young adult brunch mixer. This is something that people ask us about all the time, so we're excited about it. Um, and then the detox challenge that he mentioned earlier, we will have pamphlets. Make sure you guys get those on your way out. Um, this is the part of our service where we're going to collect our tithes and offerings. And one of the biggest things I've learned reading, like doing my own research in the Bible about what you're supposed to give is that if I don't open up my heart and my wallet and I give my love and my energy, then it can't be used. Okay, I don't always know what to do with my money, but I know God does. So this is the part where we ask you to give what you're comfortable with giving. If you're a guest here, please do not feel like you need to. Um, also take this time to register your attendance in the red pad. And I will be back at the table afterwards. If you guys are new here and you want to meet some friendly faces, we'd love to say hi to you. Your glory fill this temple. Let your power overflow. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you.
receding as the lost become the found you will never be defeated for you wear the victor's crown you are jesus the messiah the hope for all the world by your grace i live and breathe to worship you microphone snafu you may be seated it's getting so hot in here microphones running all around good evening this is the moment where we lift up the sacrament of communion which in its essence is a community meal and as we've talked about detoxing as we talked about challenging ourselves to rethink and reframe our faith we invite you to take in this meal and if you ever, ever had baggage or been told that maybe you were not worthy of this meal, that maybe you could not partake of this meal, I want to let you know that you are invited, that God has set this table, and so there's no one that can tell you you can't come. 
And so it's important for us to remember that on the night that Jesus knew it was gonna be some of his last moments on earth, he was having a community and religious Passover meal with his followers, and he decided to institute this beautiful way of community remembrance. And so when he was having that meal, he took the bread and he, he broke it and said that it represented his very body, his very self that would no longer be with them, but would be contained within them when he left. And he passed it around so that everyone could have a piece. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and he passed it around and and as Reverend Neal uh, preached about and shared with us that sacrificial system that was in place, blood was very important. We, We have a little disconnect in our culture from that. But this invitation that Jesus gave was powerful to them. And it reminded them that life is in the blood and that the life of God that flowed through Jesus was going to flow through each one of them and each one of you. So you are welcome tonight. And not only welcomed, you are invited. And not only invited, but you are blessed to come to this table tonight. So let me pray over the elements. Oh God, we are thankful that you have given us all that we need to be who you've created us to be, which as we're reminded of tonight is the individual that is different than our neighbor, but still equally loved and cared for and blessed by you, God. And so we're thankful for the elements that represent that community meal, that meal of love that should sustain us as we do our detox this week. Be in these elements and remind us you are with us. Amen. If you have a gluten allergy, please let us know and come to the center. Otherwise, those who are um, going to be preparing the meal can come on forward and know that you are invited to come to this table. On each side, there's going to be people who are going to pray with you. So if you have some extra concerns, um, please go to them and seek prayer. Come forward, for the table is ready for you.
the sun comes up it's a new day dawn it's time to see your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord bless the lord oh my soul Oh, my soul, worship your holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Worship your holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Worship your holy name. of joy every fear suddenly wiped away here in your presence all of my games now fade away every crown no longer on display Heaven is trembling in all of your wonders. All the creation is standing amazed. Here in your presence. Now 
So friends, before we close this night, uh, some of you will know that uh, there are many, many folks who are the victims of religious language that excludes rather than includes. And that for many in our community and many in our world, there are many who have been bullied and victimized. Tomorrow is Spirit Day. It's a time where we turn Facebook purple. It's an opportunity for us to speak our truth into the world. And so before we close worship this night and feel no obligation to do this, believe me, there's no peer pressure here, but if you feel able to do so, uh, we're going to invite you to come and gather on the chancel because we want to take a church photograph tonight that we can post on Facebook tomorrow morning to speak to those who have been bullied by religious language and say to them that this is a place where God loves you just the way that you are to speak to the young man who is excluded from Watermark Church and to say to him, you are welcome, you are loved just the way that you are and that this is not something that you have to choose to either be Christian or to be gay or to be lesbian or to be bisexual or to be transgender or to be an ally, but that you are a divine child of God and we want to speak that truth to you. So if you feel able to and want to, please come and join us. If you don't feel able to do that, that's just fine. Please go to Pulse Cafe and wait for us just a couple of minutes and we'll come and share fellowship with you. Uh, but we're going to close worship tonight this way so that we can speak to the world our truth of God's love. So don't be afraid. This is a chancel. It's just a stage. It's a place for some and for all of us. We can go, we can go as far as up.
there's still some room on the steps back here if y'all need some more. So y'all just went straight forward and the, the uh, video department's gonna capture it. Is this good, Roger? Awesome, everybody suck in. Now we're gonna look over to the left. In those, just look straight into the light. Look into the light, Carol Ann. Awesome. Now let's go have some Pulse Cafe.